Don't I got a ram in mine? Don't I got a ram in mine? Don't I done jump the fence? Going on down the line. In January 1848, the discovery of gold in California's American River created what one newspaper called a revolution in the ordinary state of affairs. Many white Southerners saw the new territory as a last link in a great slave-holding republic that would stretch to the Pacific shore. Within a year, 80,000 pioneers made the trek to the Gold Coast. Many masters brought their slaves. By one estimate, African Americans sent home from California over three quarters of a million dollars to buy loved ones out of bondage. When Californians petitioned Congress to be a free state, Southern leaders threatened to quit the Union and form their own country. The price for saving the Union would be the rights of black people. In 1850, in return for a free California, Southern leaders in Congress demanded a tough new fugitive slave law. No black person, fugitive or freeborn, would be safe. Under this law, a person, white or black, could be deputized on the spot to help in the recovery of a fugitive slave. So that if you were uh, on the street and a marshal was chasing a fugitive, that marshal could deputize you and you would have to participate in the recapture of that fugitive under penalty of uh, imprisonment and fine. Special commissioners were appointed to try suspected runaways. Those accused were denied a trial by jury and the right to testify. Commissioners received $10 for every person returned to slavery, only $5 if the man or woman was acquitted. It now made the federal government and northern, citi northern citizens complicitous in the process of retrieving and retaining slaves uh, back to their masters. It is the first time really in the lives of many white northerners that the slavery issue, the slavery problem kind of comes home to their neighborhoods, it comes home to their communities. It means now to harbor a fugitive slave or even to be aware of a fugitive slave is to be committing a felony. In New York, Harriet Jacobs was trying to make a new life when her former master's daughter, armed with the new law, came north to kidnap her. It was the beginning of a reign of terror to the colored population. Many families who had lived in the city for 20 years fled from it now. Many a wife discovered a secret she had never known before, that her husband was a fugitive. Many a husband discovered that his wife had fled from slavery years ago, and the children of his love were liable to be seized and carried into slavery. I seldom ventured into the streets. I went as much as possible through back streets and byways. All that winter, I lived in a state of anxiety. I found my way to Boston. I got employment. I worked hard, but I didn't tell anybody I was a slave. One night, I heard someone running behind me. Almost before I could speak, I was lifted off my feet by six or seven others, and it was of no use to resist. Anthony Burns. In 1854, the arrest of Anthony Burns triggered a showdown between Boston abolitionists and the federal government. Abolitionists swore never to allow a fugitive slave to be taken. The South, perhaps understandably, said, look, this is our constitutional right. It's in the Constitution that we have a right to get our fugitive slaves back. How can illegal groups of Northerners prevent this? As news of Burns' arrest spread, hundreds of white citizens met at Boston's Faneuil Hall. Black citizens gathered in the basement of Tremont Temple. The white meeting is going on, debating about what they should be doing and so on. When the word comes that the blacks are attacking the courthouse and the white meeting empties out, pretty soon they're all around the courthouse trying to break in to get Anthony Burns out. There was but room for one to pass in. I glanced at my black ally. 
He did not even look at me, but sprang first. We found ourselves face to face with six or eight policemen who laid about them with their clubs, driving us to the wall. I did not know until the next morning that one of the marshal's deputies, a man named Batchelder, had been killed. T.W. Higginson. The mayor ordered two artillery companies into the streets. President Franklin Pierce sent in the U.S. Marines. Boston abolitionists were already notorious for invading courthouses and jails to free captured runaways. President Pierce was determined to show Southern supporters he would enforce their fugitive slave law anywhere, even in the so-called Great Abolitionist Headquarters of Boston. Over the next three days, the crowd of protesters grew to 7,000. They surrounded the courthouse and threatened the troops who guarded Burns. Black waiters refused to serve the soldiers. Douglas and others refused to apologize for Deputy Marshal Batchelder's death. For a white man to defend his friend unto blood is praiseworthy, but for a black man to do precisely the same thing is a crime. We hold that when Batchelder undertook to play the bloodhound, he forfeited his right to live. Frederick Douglass. You could think what you wanted about slavery hundreds of miles away, but when an individual comes to your community, a black individual fleeing marshals who are going to try to grab him and send him back to slavery, it put slavery on a human level. It, ma it made people have to choose. <laughs> On June 2nd, Anthony Burns was convicted of being a fugitive slave. When the captain of the watch was ordered to bring Burns out of the courthouse to send him back, he resigned in protest. The streets are ringed or lined with people who have come in from the outlying areas, into Boston from Worcester and other distant places. Shopkeepers have draped their windows in black crepe, and there's a coffin that hangs across the street with the message, Here Lies Liberty. I feel my investment in life here is worth many percent less since Massachusetts deliberately restored Anthony Burns to slavery. My thoughts are murder to the state. My thoughts involuntarily go to plotting against the state. Henry David Thoreau. 50,000 citizens crowded the streets. Companies of U.S. Marines, local militia, and artillery marched Anthony Burns to the wharf and onto a ship bound for Virginia. The showdown was over, but some Southerners asked themselves if the recapture of one man was worth hundreds of troops, the enormous expense of $50,000, and the life of a deputy marshal. Two months later, on the 4th of July, William Lloyd Garrison publicly burned the fugitive slave law. Then, as the crowd said, amen, he burned the Constitution itself. It was a covenant with death, he said, an agreement with hell. Africans